pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do as you command. Amen. First Samuel 17, go back to the verses. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another in the valley between them. A champion named Goliath came out of the Philistine camp and shouted to the ranks of Israel, choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, he will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of the Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. The Lord, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. Why can I go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. The word of the Lord. Well, it wasn't going well for the little bugs. The birds kept winning the race. I was watching the birds, barn swallows, I think they were, late last Saturday night as they were getting dinner. If you watch these birds work for dinner, it's quite impressive. When I first watched them, I thought that, you know, maybe they had become drunk from eating fermented berries or something, the way they flew in what appeared to be totally random patterns, zooming high and low and wide and narrow paths through the air. But then I saw the purpose of their paths. They were chasing the flying bugs and with mouths wide open would swallow them up. Which got me to thinking about the bugs. The defense mechanism of bugs has to be to get bigger and faster, to outfly and escape, maneuver away from the birds. The smaller, slower bugs were likely to become the bird's dinner in this part of the circle of life. And then I thought about the birds. 
because the smaller, slower birds would not survive if the bugs got bigger and faster. And so we come to the only conclusion you can reach that the bigger and the stronger always survive. If you watch the world, that's what you would conclude, right? As a scientist, you would have to conclude the bigger and the stronger always survive. That's the way the world is. Why, even if you were just some preacher sitting outside thinking about what in the world new can I say about David and Goliath next week, that's what you would conclude. The bigger and the stronger survive. But, as we know, this is not what happens in the Valley of Elah. The big bird did not get the small bug. What appears to be the God ordered hierarchy of life did not apply in the valley of Elah as the giant faced the boy from Bethlehem. Why not? I wondered out there on my deck. And so I read the story again. And there it is, big as life. The whole key to understanding why in the world this story is in the Bible. This story that seems to be contrary to everything else we observe. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And so we learn. The key to knowing this story is simply that, that the battle is the Lord's. Here's the lesson that God wants to teach boys and girls in their Sunday school chairs and women and men in the church pews. The victory over God's enemies is won not by the fastest or the strongest or the smartest, but by God. God uses more times than we can count in Scripture the slowest, the weakest, the non-geniuses to defeat God's enemies. Now why would that be? Why would God allow the little bug to defeat the big bird, going contrary to all that life teaches us from observation? Because there are lessons about life you cannot get from watching birds chase bugs. Lessons you can only learn by coming into the presence of God and seeing what the world's eyes cannot see. Nothing is ever as it seems. The people you'll remember from two weeks ago wanted Saul as their king because he was a full head taller than anyone else. But they were not seeing reality. Saul's height is not what really mattered for the king. Because now the Israelite army is camped on one side of the valley, listening every day for 40 days to this giant man mock them and blaspheme their God. And Saul, this man a head taller than the rest of the people, was too afraid to engage in the battle. He had lost his confidence in God. Nothing is ever as it seems. For God had chosen a new king, you will remember, but his prophet Samuel thought it certainly could not be anyone other than one of these strong, young, strapping GQ model type Jesse's sons who were paraded before him. But Samuel was wrong, because God saw what he could not, that the leader he had chosen was a boy who learned to trust God to win the battle. He sat out there guarding the sheep while his brothers built their muscles and groomed their hair, and David learned a thing or two about God. And the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear are reaching out for the sheep, 
or worse, the sheep's shepherd, God would protect the shepherd, David, and his sheep. Not by giving David power to wrestle the lion or the bear, but by giving him the skill to execute a simple act of slinging a smooth stone across the, fac- across the field and into the predator. And then a psalm of joy would be sung for the divine protector. For the battle is the Lord's, David learned. And David learned his lessons well. These are the life lessons that I think God is still trying to teach us in this story. These, then, are the lessons that we should learn and which today's fathers should be teaching their children and all of us should be learning as well. The first one seems pretty simple. The first lesson is simply that we need to teach our children to see a different picture than everyone else. Paul Fritz summed it up like this. When Goliath came against the Israelites, the soldiers all thought, so big, we'll never be able to kill him. David looked at the same giant and thought, he's so big, I can't miss. To David... The enemy was not who it seemed he was. He saw what Saul could not see, that this was not an invincible foe. He didn't focus on the fact that Goliath was a full head taller still than Saul. God gave David the ability to see the path to victory that no one else could see because they looked at what seemed to be the reality. It seemed that Goliath was invincible, But David had learned to see with God's eyes. Teach that to your children. Teach them to see that the world is not what it seems. Teach them to look with the eyes of God. Which, of course, then teaches us the second lesson. That we need to always let God choose the battle. You see, God's chosen people were at this very moment in danger of extinction. The Israelite army on one side, the Philistine army on the other, they were camped on opposite sides of the valley, neither desiring to attack the other and lose hundreds of lives in the process. So they engaged in what was a common war strategy of that era. They would send out their biggest, strongest warrior to issue a challenge, and that's what's happening in this story. The Philistines send out their biggest, strongest warrior with the message that in today's world we would say, okay, buddy, you and me, mano a mano, send out your strongest warrior, and whichever wins, that warrior's side will be the victor, and the rest of you, the rest of your people will become our captives, will become our slaves. The challenge was this, then. Who is the God of this valley? Is it the gods of the Philistines, the God of Goliath, is it the God of the Israelites, and the God of David? That was the challenge. And that's why this became God's battle. It was a battle which God would fight to show that he was and is and always will be in whatever battle you have in your life the only one true God. Let God choose the battles where he will show you this. That's the life lesson to teach the children, that God helps David win God's battles. You know, so often we want to control God, right? We want to say, well, God, this is the problem, and fix this for me. But that may not be God's battle. What we need to do as people of God is align our thinking with where God and his battles. Let God choose the battle and learn to know the difference by knowing who are God's enemies. When we know who God's enemies are, injustice, poverty, homelessness, racism, when we know God's enemies, 
then we know where God will choose his battles. You know the danger for the church today? I'll tell you the danger for the church today as I see it. The danger for the church today is that we will become nothing more than pawns in political wars. Both political parties would like to use the church as a pawn in their war. Both of the political parties and many leaders in segments of the church would like to use the church to fight political battles, social battles. The danger for the church today is that we forget we need to let God choose the battle. It is so easy for us to get drawn into battles that have nothing to do with God. What is the goal of God in this earth? Could it be any more simple than God so loved the world that all who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? That's the message. And how have we polluted that message? How have we destroyed the ability of the world to hear that message by engaging in battles that are not the Lord? We need to learn the lesson. And I'm not saying th there's a purpose to be in politics. Whatever party you want to support, wonderful. There's a need for people who are involved in political activities. I was at one point in my life. That's a wonderful thing. You should be engaged in the battles of the world as well. But as a church, as a Christian, we have a separate calling to be in the world but not of it. And that's the challenge for those of us in this church and the church around the world, in our own denomination as we fight battles that really have nothing to do with the message of salvation, we need to be careful that we let God choose the battle. So, there's a third lesson. There's a third lesson as well that we need to remember side you're on. You see, the problem is as Saul looked at it, as the people, so, so you see what's going on, right? For 40 days, Goliath is out there and he's issuing this challenge. You send your biggest, strongest warrior out to me and we'll go mano a mano and whoever wins, that's it, battle over. Well, Saul, despite he's a head taller than everybody else, says, forget it. I'm the king. I'm not going out there. You men go out there. All of the men say, eh, no, I'm not doing that. There's no way I can beat that guy. So we have this stalemate that goes on for 40 days. Neither side, one in the rush the other. Well, who's going to go out there and fight this big, strong, massive warrior? Along comes the boy, who finally remembered for the people whose side he was on. That he was on the Lord's side. As we talked about on Friday at Richard's funeral, the God who carries you safely through the storms of your life is the same God who will carry you safely through the next storm. Jesus doesn't promise there will be no storms. Jesus doesn't promise there will be no valleys. He promises, though, to be in the boat with us through the storm. He promises to be in the valley with us as we confront our giants. We are riders on the storm, but with Jesus in the boat. And David goes forth in absolute confidence because he knew whose side he was on in God's battle. So the next lesson is that David goes out into battle, not in Saul's armor, but the slingshot and five smooth stones and his skill at slinging them. The battles which God fights are not one with the world's tactics. There's a whole nother lesson for the church. You know, we can try to make the church as attractive as possible to the world. We could try to make it so that joining the church is the same as joining any social club. 
We could say that being a part of the church is so easy. Well, really, what difference does it matter if you're in the optimist club or you're in a church? We could say that. I love. I was an optimist, so that's why I use them. Nothing wrong with being a member of the optimist club or whatever your social club is. But it's different to be in the church. When you say I'm a part of the church, you're saying I'm a part of the people of God who want to bring the good news to a lost and broken and desperate world. And so God says, to help you do that for me. And I'm going to help you do that not with the world's tactics, not with the fanciest marketing campaign, not with the best looking brochures, not with the biggest building nor the biggest parking lot. I'm going to help you do that if you will get on your knees and pick up five smooth stones and say, this is what I know how to do, God. I'm going to do it for you. Even a little church like Hope. Even a little church like ours with a tiny parking lot can defeat the giant if we do what we're good at. I think what we're good at is what you're good at, right? It's not about me. People say how much they love coming to funerals at Hope Church. People say how much they love coming to weddings at Hope Church. It's not about me. It's about you because you love them. We talked about Kathy's note the other week about how much she felt supported through her illness. We think about the people who get up, a whole army of people who go out there with Ron. You see, that's what it means to be a community of faith. Why become a member of a church? That's really an important question to me. Because if it's just a sign up to say I'm a member of the Optimist Club, well, that wouldn't be reason enough for me. Reason enough for me to be, to say, I identify with a body of believers. That's what it is. To say, I want to use my resources along with your resources. I want to be one of the five smooth stones. I want to be one of the five smooth stones that is going to be used by this community to defeat the enemy, to slay the giant. And when you have a giant to be slayed, we're going to help you slay your giant. When she needs a giant to be slayed, we're going to help her. When he needs a giant to be slayed, we're going to help him. That's what a church community, a pilgrim community is about. We use our resources. And there's another lesson as well. God is dependable. You see, teach your children that God is dependable. That when they're out there in life and lions and tigers and bears, oh my, come along. When they are confronted by giants, teach them that God is dependable. And the lesson has a corollary as well. Depend on God. You know, we can learn all we want that God is dependable, but what about the time when we actually need to depend on God? Depend on God. Don't turn back. Don't default into your mode of worry. Don't default into your mode of stress. Don't default into your mode, I'll buy my way out of the problem. Don't default in your mode, I'll just work an extra 10 hours. Because it doesn't matter how many hours you work, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter any of those things unless you are depending on God. The confidence of David is not in his slingshot, but in the fact that God will be with his arm when he slings it. You see, David defeats Goliath not because David is bigger or stronger, but because the battle is the Lord's and David knew it. God brings the victory. So, who are the giants that you face today? Who are the giants that each of us needs to face head on? You know, it takes the confidence of David to buy a one-way ticket to a new home. It takes the confidence of David to change a career path so you can spend more time with your children. It takes the confidence of David to say yes to adopting a child. 
It takes the confidence of David to enter into a new relationship with a friend that's probably going to be really time-consuming. It takes the confidence of David to say yes to worshiping the Lord when the world says there's no point. Whatever your giant is, remember that God has the power to both win the battle and to determine its outcome. God is the Lord of the battle and the outcome. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean there won't be a battle. Let's figure that out too, right? There's a battle. It's not that God says there won't be a battle. There's a battle for your soul, if you believe you have one. There's a battle for your soul every day. But the battle is the Lord's, and the Lord has determined the outcome. So I'd like to close with this story that comes to mind from one of the resources I read, but also because of the events of uh, this week, the killing in the church. So you remember, and I hope if you don't, you'll read about it, and I hope you'll teach, if you have children, this lesson to your children. Talk this week about Rosa. You see, we need to remember in a week like this when we come face to face with the fact that evil still has a face, that evil still has weapons. In a week like this where we see how racial hatred motivates white supremacists to murder our brothers and sisters, our African-American Christians in their church. In a week like this, we need to remember Rosa Parks a woman who believed that God opposed discrimination. That was the battle she was sure was the Lord's. And she let God choose that battle. And she used the weapon she knew, riding on a bus. It was 1955, and this 42-year-old African-American seamstress got on a bus and refused to give up her seat to a white passenger. To Rosa, as with David, the enemy of racial hatred could have looked invincible. How am I, one 42-year-old seamstress in the South, going to change the tide of racism in the United States? How am I going to do that? But she believed God and justice were on her side. So she was there in the valley. And she saw, though, what others could not see that her being arrested was the only way to bring light to evil. The courage of that woman ought to inspire all of us. She said this, quoting, Knowing what must be done does not do away with fear. Did you hear that? Knowing what must be done does not do away with fear. It was time for someone to stand up, or in my case, to sit down. And so buses were desegregated in 1956 after Martin Luther King Jr. and others followed Rosa into battle. And thus began a long battle for equality to replace hate with hope. And as we just learned, it's a bill 60 years later. If there ever was a battle that belonged to the Lord, it was this one. You know, we may not be able to fight directly in that valley, but there are valleys full of giants who need to be defeated right here in Sheboygan. Elder abuse. Homelessness. Poverty. Drug dealers. Child abusers. Let's think as a church about what it would take to see what the world cannot see. That God's justice is calling us, calling you and me to stand up, to sling smooth stones against these giants. Let's talk about, is Hope Church a Saul who's forgotten why he was made king? Or is Hope Church a David as we traverse these valleys.
And let's remember one other little boy from Bethlehem. Let's remember that other little boy from Bethlehem who had seemed surely lost every battle he fought until he won. This week, live out your life's lessons. The bugs don't always get eaten by the birds when the battle is the Lord's. Because then the impossible is possible. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story that can be told so simply that the smallest child can understand it. And this story that is so deep that the wisest minds can only begin to fathom the very tip of it. Today, Lord, May fathers hear these lessons and may they take them to heart and teach them to their children. May we as a church hear your call to carry those in the valley to the mountaintop. May we hear the call when it is time for us to stand up and to do the impossible when the battle is the Lord. 